All right, good morning. That was uh, Andrew Kastner. He is the worship pastor of Harvest New Beginnings Church in Oswego. Let's give him another hand. And welcome to everyone in the audience and everyone watching online. This is being live streamed. So uh, those of you coming up to speak, you need to behave yourselves, okay? Um, that was supposed to be funny. I didn't hear any laughter whatsoever. Am I at the wrong spot? Where am I? Okay, so I'm uh, Dr. Eric Wallace. I am the president and co-founder of Freedom Journal Institute for the Study of Faith and Public Policy. And I'm also your MC, so I'm wearing a couple of hats today. Uh, I'm supposed to be talking to you about the kingdom of God. And I will do that. Um, but I wanted to share with you my... And I'm going to introduce a, uh, a video that we're going to show. Um, some of you may know about it or heard about it, but I'm not sure if you've watched all the way through, called The Rise Principles. But before we do that, I wanted to share something. One of my favorite, one of my favorite um, verses of Scripture is Genesis 1.1. That's Hebrew, for in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And for me, that is one of the most important verses in the Bible itself, because it established God is sovereign. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not somebody else, not human beings. Before anything was, there was God. And so it establishes order out of chaos, because we know there was chaos then. In three days, he sets up structure. Uh, and in the next three days, he actually fills that structure, right? Uh, in verse 26, of course, he goes through a number of different days, and he says, it's good, it's good, it's good. When you get to verse 26, we read the words uh, that let's make man in our image, uh, and give them dominion, let them subdue the earth, uh, to govern all things, right? He says to multiply and fill the earth. In other words, God creates two genders, right? Male and female, not ten. He tells them to have children, to procreate. He says nothing about aborting anything. He thus establishes marriage and family between a man and a woman to have children and to rule the planet. And says that this is good. And in chapter 2, he says all that he's created is very good. Also in chapter 2, we zoom in on day 6 and God says that something is not good. That it's not good for man to be alone. So he creates a helper, a compatible part for Adam. So in case you didn't understand chapter 1, chapter 2 makes it clear that it's one man and one woman in marriage. Can I get an amen or something? <clears throat> he established marriage. He established kids. He gives us dominion and governance over the planet with just one condition, or what I call one public policy. He says, don't eat of that tree. They had everything they needed, everything they wanted. Man had his wife, woman had her man. They even had jobs, right? This is love and freedom. Love gives choices. Slavery just demands. God gives us everything we need and then says, all you have to do is obey me in this one thing. And the New Testament will say, come follow me. You see, slavery and dictatorship takes everything you have and forces servitude. In the first two chapters of Genesis, God determined what was good and what was not good. And Adam and Eve and humans today want to determine what is good apart from God. They seek liberation from what they perceive to be oppressive commands, but end up in bondage. While those who submit willfully to the rule of God find true freedom. How does this relate to government? We'll watch the, the rise principles and you'll see. I'm Dr. Eric Wallace, president and co-founder of Freedom Journal Institute for the study of faith and public policy. It is my privilege to share with you the rise principles an acronym and guiding philosophy developed by Freedom's Journal Institute to rally our communities together to collectively rise and build. These principles, responsible government, individual liberty and fidelity, strong family values, and economic empowerment 
represent our unique articulation of conservative ideas and values meant to both vigorously challenge liberal ideology as well as to create a paradigm shift in how people view matters of faith, race, and public policy. The purpose of this video series is to clear up misinformation about what it means to be a conservative. In recent years, conservatism has been maligned as racist, out of touch, or just for the rich. These characterizations could not be further from the truth. Our hope is that as a result of this series, the RISE principles will begin to help to dispel these false narratives, as well as inspire a whole new generation of people who are willing to stand for what they say they believe, and to actively engage in the political process that represents us. This is the first of five videos which we hope you will watch in their entirety. Human history is replete with men and women who willingly stood against the tyranny and opposition of those individuals and governments that refused to recognize the sovereignty of God. They fought to preserve their liberties and the freedoms of those dearest to them against all odds. These early freedom fighters fought and even gave their lives as they clung to a set of principles and convictions and values written upon their hearts and ingrained in their minds. These principles gave rise to a vision for freedom which has been passed down from generation to generation. As conservatives, we too pledge to hold to a set of core values and principles that are foundational to our political philosophy. These have been dubbed the RISE principles, responsible government, individual liberty and fidelity, strong family values, and economic empowerment. At the core of the RISE principles are those biblical doctrines which duly recognize a sovereign God as the creator and sustainer of life. They acknowledged that out of chaos God brought forth order and that he declared the work of his creation good. They recognized that man was created in the image of God and given authority to rule and subdue the earth, which is what gives mankind purpose. It is also what makes each human being a unique creation with God-given potential. The RISE principles acknowledge that God is the originator of government or law from the prohibition in the Garden of Eden to the Ten Commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai and to Jesus' proclamation of the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. These principles recognize that since the fall of man, mankind has been in rebellion against God and that humanity in its fallen state needs God's redemption. Additionally, the RISE principles acknowledge that God has provided redemption for all mankind through the advent, death, and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ and a promise to everyone who believes in the Son of God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who writes upon the heart a moral law, which is testified to in the scripture. This new law allows people to govern themselves and to live at peace with God and one another as members of a new political reality known as the Kingdom of God. It is from this foundation that our founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence and established the Constitution of the United States of America. In it, they wrote of unalienable rights from our Creator and not from men, along with the conviction of equality of all mankind before God, as they battled the overthrow the tyranny of a foreign rule. Furthermore, it is this same worldview with which many of the heroes of our past, such as Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, fervently fought to maintain the principles and values of freedom and economic empowerment principles we today continue to fight for in our modern society. And lastly, to this, the RISE principles acknowledge America's African American history, which includes a storied history and legacy of struggle against social injustices, one which is deeply rooted in conservative principles upon which this nation was founded. We also acknowledge that distinctive to this heritage is the presence of the black church which has served as the core of the black community, as well as the center for social, political, economic, and cultural activity. As a political philosophy, black conservatism is based on those African-American traditions, values, and experiences, both political and cultural, which place God at the center of our existence, and which securely root the tenets of life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness into the political fabric of American society. We come to the first of our principles represented by the letter R in RISE. The R is responsible government. But what makes government responsible or accountable? Does the rule of law restrain men 
or government. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as a supreme authority or to governors, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Romans 13, 1 through 5, echoes the same sentiment. In verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, For he, the government official, is God's servant to do good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. However, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 19 through 20, Moses warns judges and officers against pay-to-play politics when he says, You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. With this foundation, the Founding Fathers looked beyond those who would administer the law and justice to codify it in a document that would restrain the administrators of the law. Patrick Henry said, The Constitution is not an instrument for government to restrain the people. It is an instrument for the people to restrain the government, lest it come to dominate our lives and interests. Thus, a responsible government must work both ways to ensure justice. The overreach of government brings tyranny, while the lack of sound laws invites anarchy. It is critical that we have a balance of just laws and righteous administrators to enforce those laws. The responsible government therefore asserts that citizens deserve a government which is fiscally responsible. Waste, fraud, and duplication in government must be eliminated. All monetary transactions except for classified operations should be transparent. Public debt, except for infrastructure, should be avoided. Government budgets should fit within existing revenues. Spending reductions, not tax increases, are the preferred solutions to revenue shortfalls. Taxation should be restricted to the most minimal levels. The burden of taxation should be spread equally as possible among its citizens. In addition, the goal of taxation should never, never be employed for the redistribution of wealth or restricting productivity, economic growth, or savings. Therefore, there should be no talk about graduated taxes that discriminate against business owners and the wealthy. A flat tax is the fairest tax for all people, where everyone pays the same percentage, which is their fair share. Government policy should encourage self-sufficiency and promote the work ethic among citizens. Public funds should not be used to support persons who are capable, albeit unwilling, to provide for their own needs. Government welfare programs for the needy should strive to enforce the dignity of the individual, strengthen the family unit, and encourage the individual's potential for self-sufficiency. Government policy should be constrained by the rule of law embodied in the state and federal constitutions, which innovatively guarantees our liberties by spreading power among three branches of the federal government and between the federal government and the states. Hence, each branch of government, including the delineation of authority between state and federal, should perform their function as defined by the United States Constitution and various state constitutions. One of the primary responsibilities of the federal government is to protect the nation and the American people. This requires a strong and capable military, a capable intelligence services, and a vigorous law enforcement and homeland security capacity. It also mandates an efficient and proactive foreign policy that looks after American interests in conjunction with our allies, yet stands resolute against our enemies. Unfortunately, corrupt leadership will always try to pervert justice. But Jeremiah 9, 23-24 reminds us, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Responsible government reflects justice and righteousness for all. In the letter from a Birmingham jail, 
Dr. King spoke about our moral duty to obey just laws and our responsibility to disobey unjust laws when he said, one may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One is not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Welcome to the second of our RISE principles. The I stands for individual liberty and fidelity. Again, the Bible tells us in both Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 that we should be law-abiding citizens. However, in 1 Peter 2.16, it also tells us that we are to live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Hence, we have a certain amount of liberty, but that liberty is kept in check by our fidelity to our God and His law above all others. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21, the 10th commandment states that we not covet or desire our neighbor's wife or any of their possessions. The 10th commandment is actually the one law that governs the other nine. From the commandments to have no other gods before him, to not murdering or committing adultery or even stealing, we are encouraged to provide for ourselves and not to scheme or misappropriate what belongs to others. John Adams noted, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Therefore, individual liberty and fidelity requires that laws restrict the free exercise of liberty and property. Consequently, no law should be passed unless there is a compelling reason to do so. The proponents of any bill should have the burden of proof that passage is necessary. Laws should reflect the morals of our society but also encourage and promote individual character. Dr. King's dream was that we be judged by the content of our character and not by the color of our skin. It was a nod towards a view of people as individuals and a break from the skewed collectivistic thinking characteristic of liberal thought. Therefore, individuals should never be seen as only members or appendages of a larger group. Rather, we are each individuals with rights as such. These rights include, but are not limited to, those rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution. They should also include those God-given rights of freedom, not specified in any written document, which necessarily exists in a nation where the individual is more important than the state. Conversely, these rights should not negate the responsibility of individuals' obligation to conduct him or herself as a responsible and productive member of society. However, the state is only responsible to protect your rights from being infringed, not to provide them. The right to bear arms or to have health care does not mean the government is obligated to acquire them on your behalf. No civilization can succeed and thrive for any duration unless free people act with fidelity to a core set of values and principles. Each of us must be accountable for our actions and to endeavor to build a better society to improve both our own lives and the lives of others. All citizens are entitled to the security of self and property. Government's primary task is the maintaining of law and order to ensure these rights are protected. Accordingly, the system of justice must afford all people access to competent representation, as well as a level playing field to ensure the imperatives of justice can be met. Dr. King once explained the difference between a just law and an unjust law. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Individual liberty and fidelity reflects the sanctity and the dignity of all human life while calling on each individual to live with discipline and purpose. Our third of four RISE principles focuses on the family. The S in RISE is for strong family values. From the beginning of creation, marriage and family have been an important institution established by God. In Genesis 1, verses 26 through 30, 
there's an emphasis on humanity created in the image and likeness of God to fulfill His divine plan and purposes. Our understanding of family also extends to Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 through 24, where the emphasis is on finding a helper, a companion suitable for Adam, an integral partnership intended to complete Adam, but also a reflection of the triune nature of God. Marriage and family are a sacred bond, and Jesus tells us in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, that the husband and wife become one flesh, and that what God has joined together should not be separated. The epistles elaborate on family dynamic, giving instructions for husbands, wives, and children found in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7, Ephesians 3, 1 through 7, and Colossians 3, 18 through 19. Further warning for the parents and children are found in Colossians 3, 20 through 21, in Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4. As Paul encourages children to honor their parents and parents not to frustrate their children, but to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Frederick Douglass understood the ramifications of unhealthy families and lack of values when he said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. The rise principle of strong family values echoes these sentiments. Strong family values includes our belief that marriage is intended to be a permanent relationship between one man and one woman and is foundational for healthy and stable families. Marriage functions to satisfy the longings of the human heart, to give and to receive unconditional love, to welcome and to ensure the full physical and emotional development of children, and to reinforce and perpetuate the installation of moral values and principles. Strong family values must be preserved and impressed upon each generation. The natural family is the foundation of society. Therefore, the state should promote its formation while interfering in its function as little as possible. Family unity and interdependency are necessary to foster and encourage culture, learning, long-term national stability. Therefore, two-parent households should be encouraged and fatherhood honored as the means of diminishing the development of delinquency in children and young adults. Our earnest conviction is that many of the black community's problems, as well as other communities, could be solved if we gave more attention to building strong and healthy families. We believe that to minimize confrontation with police, eliminate visits to abortion clinics, school dropouts and delinquency, incarcerations, as well as illicit use of drugs and drug suppliers, we must focus on combating the underlying problem, the dysfunction and disintegration of the black family. Education starts at home and is the first classroom children have. The family does serve as the center for social, educational, economic, and spiritual life to build strong bonds among generations and to pass on a way of life that has transcendent meaning. Since education begins at home, it should remain the prerogative of parents to choose where they send their children for further education. Human life is sacred and invaluable from conception to natural death. Protection for the unborn and elderly and compassion for the sick and infirmed are essential elements for a culture of life as well as necessary for the health of citizens in a God-fearing society. The free exercise of religious faith is paramount to the health and the well-being of a free society. Government is prohibited in the establishment of any religion, but also banned from interfering in the practice thereof. Citizens therefore should be free to worship and practice their faith as they choose without fear of governmental interference, coercion, or manipulation. The church is the extension of the family and the instrument for the work of God to impact societal values. Duty, honor, self-sacrifice, love of neighbor, and country are some of those values. But equally important are the pursuit of justice and equality before the law. It is the church where the disenfranchised and the marginalized find redemption, restoration, forgiveness, and reconciliation before God and man. Let me take a moment to quote a few well-known people who agree with our assessment of the family. The only rock I know that stays steady, the only institution I know that works is the family, the Iacocca. There is no doubt that it is around the family and the home that all the greatest virtues, the most dominating virtues of humans are created, strengthened and maintained, Winston Churchill. The family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society. 
It is entitled to protection by society and the state. Eleanor Roosevelt. At the end of your life, you will never regret not having passed one more test, not winning one more verdict, not closing one more deal. You'll regret time not spent with a husband, a friend, a child, or a parent, was Barbara Bush. Of all the rocks upon which we build our lives, we are reminded today that family is the most important, that U.S. Senator Barack Obama. These strong family values are inevitably a reflection of the strength, courage, and the power of its people. The last of our RISE principles is represented by the letter E, which stands for economic empowerment. There are a plethora of biblical references to money, which we do not have time to explore. However, I will briefly point out in the parable of the talents recorded in Matthew 25, 14 through 28, and also Luke 19, 12 through 26, without full explanation of the parables. The principle in both contexts is the preparing for Jesus' return. Both speak of three servants who are given money to invest while the master's away. Two of the servants in Matthew make a profit while the third hides his money. The two who make a profit receive a reward. The third servant who hides the money is reprimanded for being wicked and lazy. The master then takes away the money and trusts it to the lazy servant and gives it to one of the other servants. One of the explicit messages in this parable is that we each must be productive with what we've been given. The warning for those who are not productive is that whatever they were given will be taken away. Jesus says, for everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. The final judgment for unproductive servant was punishment. He was called a worthless servant and was to be thrown outside into the darkness where, quote, there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 30. Consequently, it is not where we start that matters. It is what we do with what God has given us and our faithfulness to the task. Booker T. Washington understood this when he said, I have learned that success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome while trying to succeed. Frederick Douglass is quoted as saying, our destiny is largely in our own hands. If we find, we shall have to seek. If we succeed in the race of life, it must be by our own energies and by our own exertions. Others may clear the road, but we must go forward or be left behind in the race of life. Douglas also warned against relying solely on others, but instead urged blacks to demonstrate self-sufficiency when he said, if we remain poor and dependent, the riches of other men will not avail us. If we are ignorant, the intelligence of other men will do but little for us. If we are foolish, the wisdom of other men will not guide us. If we are wasteful of time and money, the economy of other men will only make our destitution more disgraceful and hurtful. Economic empowerment underscores these principles. Through free markets, individuals and groups form relationships and exercise self-government. The state should only intervene to establish minimum health and safety standards and encourage competition. When the government does choose to use power to regulate free people, it should be exceedingly cautious to use the least burdensome method possible. The free market is the most efficient way for people who are less fortunate to advance from poverty to prosperity. Economic empowerment focuses on wealth production, not wealth redistribution, job creation versus job security and investments in tomorrow without mortgaging our future. As individuals, we have the right to choose in a free market, albeit we are vested with responsibility to inform ourselves and make choices that best suit our needs. While the government should actively enforce fraud statutes, it should not attempt to protect the public from what it perceives as poor choices by eliminating those possibilities from the market. Healthcare service is a commodity that is best procured through the free market. Access to healthcare becomes more available and affordable when healthcare professionals are allowed to compete in the free market. Individual health savings accounts, health clinics in retail stores, concierge medicine are all products of the free market in a healthcare industry because one size does not, I repeat, does not fit all. 
Private property is the cornerstone of a free nation. Therefore, public needs should override individual property rights only in the most convincing circumstances, not merely for the sake of convenience. In those instances, when a compelling need does exist, property owners should be justly compensated for their whole loss. Government largesse is counterproductive to economic empowerment. Government handouts encourage dependency. Assistance given to the marginalized and the disenfranchised members of society should always support and move individuals towards self-sufficiency. The private sector, such as a faith-based organization, are better equipped to offer counseling, housing, clothing, food, and education to help people get back on their feet. Economic empowerment is the engine of a free society whose legacy depends on the exercise and the ingenuity of every contributing part. This ends our explanation of the RISE principles. It is my hope and prayer that you have learned more about conservative ideas and values with a willingness to begin to look at political candidates and party platforms in light of the information provided in these videos. May God bless you and keep you. And thank you for watching.